Sky Howdy, and welcome back to another episode of World Bigfoot Perhaps we need some outside universal threat to make us recognize this common bound. I occasionally think how quickly our differences worldwide would vanish if we were facing an alien threat from outside this world. For now, we say goodnight to Swamp Dweller and hello to the man, the myth, and the cryptid legend from World Bigfoot Radio and the Cryptid Report. Here's Super Duke Sullivan. Report comes on in, Super Duke, always bringing us some spooky story from the nether regions of the forest and jungles from around the world. How you been doing, Super Duke? Hey, Dave. I'm exhausted. <laughs> it's been Wait, a very long... Yeah, it's been a very long day. I'm uh, betting new uh, roomies here again to replace the defective one I got stuck with. And so they've been in and out of the place all day long while I'm trying to get other things done. So it's like really wearing me down. But in the process of all the other things that were going on today, I was reminded of uh, several interesting things. And, you know, uh, talking about this time of the year, we're just after the big spooky Halloween and all that kind of stuff. And uh, in um, February, in the second week of February, so 50 years later, and I'm supposed to be some kind of uh, knowledgeable about all these different cryptids and sub varieties, and I still don't know what the hell I saw. So, so much for being an expert. Uh, and it kind of and it bothers me. Yes, the only good that came out of that is that uh, I had somebody who was like Sabila Irwin, very good, used to be a police forensic artist, and still had all the computer program for it, so they can make faces that look like faces without using a pencil. And he did a recreation of it for me, and. Uh, Aside from giving me more PTSD, because the closer it got to looking like it actually looked, the scarier it was every time I had to review it. Um, the only good that came out of it is that, that, of course, I made it public and I had, over the course of the next two years, three other people from different parts of the country contacted me and went, I saw that thing. I don't know what that is, but that's exactly what I saw. <laughs> Where did you see this? And then we're like, yay, very small club, but at least somebody else has seen this damn thing, whatever it is. So, you know, ongoing mystery there. But I'm also reminded that a few months later in the fall, right around this time of the year, 50 years ago, there was a very pivotal TV show. And a lot of people talk about, uh, especially cryptid researchers and stuff, being influenced by In Search Of with Leonard Nimoy. And yeah, he was cheating. He was using all of the uh, computerized uh, sensor systems on the Enterprise and scanning the Earth's cryptids and then didn't want to break the prime directive and let us know stuff too early. So it only gave us certain information on it. But anyway, a lot of people were, you know, very much influenced by In Search Of. Well, there was another show that wasn't In Search Of, but that was really influential with a lot of people my age and other cryptid people will tell you about it. And this was just a TV show that was a scary TV show called Cole Shack, The Night Stalker. 
K-O-L-C-H-A-K. And this guy was an independent news reporter who wore the uh, crappy white suit <laughs> and the white shoes. And he had his little straw hat and he had his little case that he'd carry around and he had his camera with him. And he, he worked for the independent news service, which, uh, you know, at the time when there was no internet, most of the news was being run by the big mainstream media, the big newspapers, the big news TV channels, radio stations and whatnot. But there was still this independent news service, which, uh, which little reporters would go run around and dig up interesting stories and uh, try and write them up. And if they were interesting enough, they'd sell them to the bigger outlets and then they'd make money off that. So that's what the character Carl is supposed to be doing. Now, Carl has really good senses as far as researching things and really bad luck at running into things that he shouldn't. So the whole <laughs> gist of the show is that he keeps running into things like uh, eight undying immortals, vampires, uh, lizard men in tunnel systems underneath cities, and you know horrible things like this and he finds out that there's something weird going on he starts researching it more he starts realizing there's some kind of weird paranormal supernatural monster thing going on and then he gets more information on it he does all the research himself just like modern day cryptid people do and then he tries to of course go to the cops and tell them hey there's monsters out here and the cops go ha, carl get lost you crazy lunatic i don't care if you got pictures you're making stuff up because you're trying to make a buck off your crazy stories. And he gets the same kind of thing from his uh, his main boss that he works for and everything. And of course, by about halfway through the show, he's figuring out that nobody's going to help him and that he's going to have to deal with the monsters himself, which most of the time he does successfully. <laughs> Get rid of the monster too yet. And I used to love this show when I was a kid. I just thought it was so um, entertaining. It was so well-written. Darren McGavin played the part of Cole, Carl Kolshak. And he is great at looking like he's just whizzing himself with terror. So he was the perfect guy to play the part of this intrepid journalist who was super tough up until the moment that he saw the monster. And then he'd like want to whiz himself or run away <laughs> inevitably. But he'd still pluck up the courage to defeat the monster anyway. So here's the upshot of this story. I realized that without intending to, I have become Carl Kolshak. Because what do I do? I research cryptids, I find out they're real, I get more information on them, I try and tell people they think I'm crazy, and I put it out on the independent news service, which today is called the internet. So I have somehow become Carl Kolshak. <laughs> and for any of you that haven't ever, ever, ever seen that, you can see most of the episodes still on YouTube. They're absolutely great. I highly recommend the uh, Spanish Moss, um, I think what it's, it's Spanish Moss Mystery or something. Spanish Moss something or another. Go look it up. It's great. Really excellent. Maybe you have to brush with death before you can really reflect on life, on the people and times that really meant something to you, like childhood, dreams of sailing on silver seas and wooden shoes, visions of sugar plums dancing. Silver seas sugar plums the visions the nightmares of a child are perhaps the most frightening and horrifying of any human animal can conjure some people who were in chicago during the first stifling hot weeks of july would say that was so if they were still alive
evidence for my theory was washed away through the Chicago Sanitary Canal. But why call it a theory? It was really a fact. How could it possibly happen? Well, they say that the mystics of India, while in a trance, can grow back severed fingers and move boulders with the power of their minds. It's documented. Somehow, Paul Langlois, in his special dream state, did even more than that. He created a palpable horror. When I contacted the sleep lab, they told me Dr. Pollock had lost his taste for pure research. He'd shaved off his beard and gone back to Long Island to work in the family shoe business. Now what about Paul Langlois, the innocent test subject of that pure research? Well, he's just plain dead. Uh, and so the other thing is that, well, you know, in the course of becoming this roving reporter, independent news service guy that's research encrypted, you got to start somewhere. So I was thinking about that earlier today. You know, what... What's the first time that I ever interviewed somebody? When did that happen? And it occurs to me that actually that happened before I ever saw my first cryptid. And the person that I interviewed, anybody that's ever heard of the seven degrees of separation, the person I interviewed gives me one degree of separation from Johnny Carson, uh, Buffalo Bill Cody, and uh, Custer. Now, what the hell am I talking about? Well, the first time that I interviewed somebody, I was five years old. And there was this guy that was going around doing a tour. He was very, very elderly. He had started out with Buffalo Bill's Wild West show. And he had been one of the extras that you can see in all the old silent movies where the natives come riding in to attack the, the cowboys. He was usually one of the guys on the horses. There was actually an Indian. And he had been in Buffalo Bill's Wild West show. And he was, in fact, an Indian chief the Sioux. He got to tour all over with Buffalo Bill's Wild West show as long as that was going on. He went over into Europe, toured all over there, met the king and queen, blah, 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 came back here. And in his later years during the 1960s, he actually appeared on Johnny Carson. If you want to go Google image, you can see a picture of that. So this gentleman was most famous for what had happened when he was a little bitty kid. So I go to meet this guy. I'm five years old. I got my four-year-old brother with me, so I'm tiny. And this guy like looks like a giant to me, even though he's sitting in a chair and he's very old. He's got the full native chief regalia on, looks very impressive, has the weathered face. I mean, it just looks like the painting of the ancient Indian you would see, except this is flesh and blood, real life. This guy's 100 years old. I'm five years old. I want to ask him this question really, really bad, but... If he jumps up and smites me or something, I'm afraid, you know, he's going to get me because he can, he can reach me. He might have a hidden war club or something. So carefully making sure that my four-year-old brother is nearby in case I have to shove him in front and run for it. I pluck up all my courage and I ask Chief Red Fox, who was at the Little Bighorn, did you get to scalp Custer? And he looked at me like, was I serious? And he went, no. And then I was incredibly disappointed and I went, oh, and he got the hugest smile on his face. And right at that moment, my dad took a picture. He actually was there. He was a little kid when that happened. And after the whole battle was over, he was one of the kids who got tasked with dragging away anybody that was wounded, that was still alive and picking through all the wreckage to see if there was anything usable and dragging that away too. So oh, one wow. degree of separation. So think about that now. This guy was alive and was there for the Battle of Little Bighorn, and I met him when I was a little kid. So a lot of times you, you like to think about things that happened in the Wild West being infinitely long ago, but really they weren't that long ago. That is strange, Super Duke. Very, very strange, you know? I don't even know where to go with that. Yeah, well, I mean, there you go. You know, I, it that, that took like all the courage I had as a little five-year-old kid to walk up to this, you know, living statue of the most impressive Indian chief you could see sitting there giving me that look and go, did you get to scalp Custer? And the look on his face was just so surprised, you know. And then he got this huge grin because he didn't like Custer. And that was just at the point where public sentiment was starting to turn around and everybody was starting to go, well, wait a minute, we 
like totally screwed over these people and took their land away from them and stuff. And that really hadn't penetrated into the culture at all. And I think he was so thrilled to see this little blonde haired five year old kid being all indignant that he didn't get to scalp Custer. <laughs> and uh, yeah, he asked us, he asked me a couple more questions and I was like, oh yeah, Custer was a very bad man. Good that you guys got rid of him, something along those lines. I was only five years old, but I was always, when it came to playing Cowboys and Indians, I was on the side of the Indians. I wasn't playing Cowboys. <laughs> well, there you go. There you go. How does this tie into the cryptids? Well, there's a lot of reports of giants from North America and people digging up their bones and some of them even being seen recently. And the one thing that always keeps coming up is, well, where's the skeletons? Well, there's these people at this place called the Smithsonian that keep dragging them away. And a lot of this stuff was actually found during when Chief Red Fox was alive and dug up and drug away. And let's not forget that up until the late 1800s, it was perfectly fine to talk about this stuff. As a matter of fact, uh, Abraham Lincoln, during his address at Niagara Falls, made mention of we're now seeing the same site that the eyes of those giants that once ruled North America gazed upon. Where the hell did that come from? Now, nowadays, that would you would think the, the president was a total loony if he said that. And back in those days, everybody took it as, well, yeah, of course, used to be giants. But then suddenly something changed, you know, and so what was it that changed? Um, and really what it was, was the, um, the Smithsonian. And if I can find the beginning of this part here, where it really talks about Powell. Powell, when Congress created the Bureau of Ethnology in 1879, Powell was named its first director a post he held until his death in 1902, placed under the auspices of the Smithsonian Institution. And where did the Smithsonian come from? Well, there was a guy named Smithson who died without any heirs, had a ridiculously huge amount of money and donated it to make museum and preserve history over here. And um, it's hilarious to note that Smithson's body was reburied at the Smithsonian Castle in the 20th century. In a sarcophagus that lists his age at death to 75, when it's common knowledge, he was closer to 65 when he died, so they can't even get that right. So anyway, uh, because of his experience as a Western explorer, Powell was considered an expert on the geography of the American West and was asked to write a report on the history of the ancient tribes and their probable origins, to, uh, which was to become the official policy of the Smithsonian for the next 100 plus years. The title of Powell's first report to the Secretary of the Smithsonian in 1879 on limitations to the use of some anthropological data is revealing and shows the ulterior policy at work within the nascent institution. The following is taken from that report. Investigations in this department are of great interest, and I have attracted to the field a host of workers that a general review of the mass of published matter exhibits the fact that the uses to which the material has been put has not always been wise. In the moments of antiquity found throughout North America in camp and village sites, grave mounds, ruins, scattered works of art, the origin and development of art in savage and barbaric life may be satisfactorily studied. Incidentally, too, hints of customs may be discovered, but outside of this, the discoveries made have often been illegitimately used, especially for the purpose of connecting the tribes of North America with peoples of so-called races of antiquity in other portions of the world. A brief review of some conclusions that must be accepted in the present status of the science will exhibit the futility of these attempts. And then Powell then goes on to definitively state there are no foreign influences to be seen or studied in relation to the Pueblo and mound building cultures of the Americas that are believed to precede the American Indians. In relation to this dismissive comment regarding any connection to the lost tribes from the old world, it's interesting to note that Powell was the son of a preacher in Palmyra, New York, the lost his flock to Mormon missionaries. So in the study of these antiquities, there has been much unnecessary speculation in respect to the relation existing between the people to whose existence they attest and the tribes of Indians inhabiting the country during a historic period. It may be said that the Pueblos discovered in the southwestern portion of the U.S. and further south through Mexico and perhaps into Central America, tribes are known having a culture quite as far advanced as any exhibited in the discovered ruins. In this respect, then, there's no need to search for extra-limital origin through lost tribes for any art there exhibited. 
With regard to the mounds so widely scattered between the two oceans, it may also be said that mound building tribes were known in the earliest history of the discovery of this continent, and vestiges of art discovered do not excel in any respect the art of the Indian tribes known to history. There is therefore no reason for us to search for an extra limital origin through lost tribes for the arts discovered in the mounds of North America. Foremost among the wrong-headed theories Powell championed is evolution. So we're shown charts of man becoming bipedal and each new man becoming bigger and smarter than the last. This is, however, in direct contradiction to the charts we use for every other animal we study. We, I've only to look at a bird and be told that it was once a dinosaur to know how to pulse this paradigm of man's growth is. Look at the evolution of most animals, and the record says they got smaller over time, not bigger. However, with all the modern edifices of education built on the theory of evolution and the growing, st growing stature of humanity, we can't very well have the Smithsonian running around telling people that we've degenerated from an ancient race of giants who once ruled America. Now, can we? The second theory current at the time was called Uniform Gradual History, a benign theory that says Earth goes long for huge spans of time with no catastrophes. The opposite of this theory is the more modern school of thought called catastrophism, ba based on the provable fact that disasters actually happen frequently and often. The record here in America speaks clearly on this subject. It relates not only to the disappearance of the Western inland civilization, dating back around 5000 BC, which was wiped out by volcanoes, but also to the sudden cessation of the copper trade around 1500 BC. Why is this significant? Because Cretan culture was wiped out in a series of catastrophes brought on by the massive explosion of the Santorini volcanoes on one of the Cretan Empire islands. I do not think it's a coincidence that in 1500 BC, the volcano wiped out the Cretan Empire and the exodus in Egypt factors into this and shut down the copper trade in America for almost 2,000 years. The third major contributing factor to the extent historical myopia is the land bridge theory, which states that all the Indian tribes reached America from Asia across the Alaskan land bridge. The man who came up with this absurd and unprovable theory is none other than Dr. Ailes Herdlicka, the first curator of physical anthropology in the U.S. National Museum, now called the Smithsonian Institution. Super Duke, I'm going to put you on hold right there. That's what I love, the Giants and Super Duke melding together on the Krypton Report tonight. Melding. Never get to use that word. Bigfoot Radio, Super Duke Sullivan continues the Krypton Report on Spaced Out Radio right after this. So there you go, running an agenda. Agenda, agenda, agenda. Can't do real science, got to run an agenda. I do have a question for you regarding that, uh, but okay. I'll wait till the show. Oh, okay. Now I got several yeah. actual reports of them digging up these bones and stuff. Now I'll end with, and then the friendly people from the Smithsonian showed up and hauled the bones away for later study. Yeah, of course you never saw them again. No, of course not. Hey, Super Duke, you see that strange video of all those uh, sheep in in going in a in, circle? In, I know that's really weird. Very my strange. Goodness. Yeah, what's been freaking me out is that video of the guy that got the uh, video of the giant walking on the mountain ridge up there in uh, Jasper and then did a bunch of follow-up videos on it, got threatened, and then mysteriously died. That's a little yes. suspicious. Yes. I've heard that uh, two times in the last couple of days, and you're down the third. There's like three or four channels that have already done full-length videos on it. And showed all of his updates and videos and everything he posted, too. And the uh, the report of his death, which has no cause listed. Right. And this guy wasn't old or anything. He was in his 30s, probably, if that. Yeah. The guy was from Whistler. Yep. Andrew yeah. something, if I remember right. Something like that. One second, Super. Surf Jair, Pam, Lori, Dig, uh, Thomas, and W. Decker, thank you so much for the super chats tonight. Very much appreciate the love. We're at 100 thumbs up. If you haven't done so yet, give us a thumbs up or a thumbs down. And if you're new, don't forget to hit subscribe. Good morning, Stephen Finnegan. And here we go with the final half hour.
Round and third, we're headed for home tonight on Space Down Radio. My name is Dave Scott. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us. We very much appreciate it. I want to remind you that if you missed all of this show or others, check out our free archives by going to youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio. Do old Davey the favor, hit that subscribe button. Our website is spacedoutradio.com. We have a plethora of features for you. Rock out to Bumblefoot, read Shirky Poo's Newswire, check out our swag as well. Follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio, Instagram at Spaced Out Radio Show, and on TikTok at Spaced Out Radio. We continue on tonight with the Cryptid Report from World Bigfoot Radio. Super Duke Sullivan is back with us. How you doing, Duke? I'm doing. You're always just doing, man. I got a question about the Smithsonian stuff you were just talking about. All right. Why yep. would they be stealing bones of all these giants and just hiding them from us? Well, yeah, that's the whole point that I was getting to right there. First of all, I got Powell with his dismissive and weird attitude on all this. And then shortly after he takes over the Smithsonian, they get this thing called the Powell Doctrine. I guess they named that after. And it had a lot to do with Manifest Destiny because after the Civil War, they had plenty of nothing to do but go expand west and take over everything. So what they were trying to say is that the poor savages needed civilizing because they've always been living in dirt huts and eating you know, grass or whatever, and they have no civilization. So it be, behooves us to bring our tremendous and wonderful civilization to them and force it on them whether they like it or not. And one of the things that they wanted to make sure of is that there wasn't any evidence that any of the people on the continent had actually had a high civilization at any point, because then they wouldn't really need civilizing, would they? So that was one of the things that they're trying to cover up. And also, as it stated there, and what I was reading earlier, the idea that there had been connections with North America from Europe at the time was just completely verboten. And nowadays, we know that that's absolutely for a fact. The Sea People, Phoenicians, uh, you know, Atlanteans, whatever you want to call them, Minoans, um, at the same time that all of the trade in bronze was going on over in the Mediterranean, well, they had to get that copper from somewhere. And they have all these examples of the old things that were made at that time. And interestingly, for those unaware of it, um, copper can be traced even after it's used to make something back to its point of origin because they all have peculiar um, signature in them depending on where they were originally dug up out of the ground. And about 40% of that copper that made its way into all the copper and bronze things that uh, the Minoan civilization was scattering all over the Mediterranean came from North America. No question about it. So how did it get over there if there wasn't any contact with North America during the time that these early civilizations were busy running around? See, and that's, you know, again, they don't want that linkage made, so they're covering all this stuff up. We know for a fact now that there's a whole bunch of abandoned copper mines up around the Great Lakes. One of them's even got a stone slab on the uh, right next to it that they discovered that's got carvings of, guess what, the Phoenicians on it. So this has all been about a massive cover-up of the actual history of North America to make it comport with what they wanted to tell the people. And that's why it went from, sure, there were giants, to, nope, there was no giants. Of course not. Of course not. But where are these giants being seen today? I, I, you know, I rarely hear reports of them in North America. A lot of them seem to come from the Middle East. Yeah, I think, well, there's, I don't think there's necessarily more reports from over there, although it would make sense that there's still some of the giants lingering around the area of the Levant, because when the um, Israelites went to war with them, according to the biblical narrative, they managed to wipe out or chase most all of them out of their area. But how far are they going to chase them? You know, how far is far enough? Are they going to keep chasing them to the end of the earth? Well, probably not. So at some point they're going to get in, you know, the mountains around Afghanistan and Pakistan, perfect place for them to go hide. Nobody wants to live there anyway. And uh, so who's going to go mess with them? Um, and then the other thing is that there are reports from giants in North America, but they're just rare. Um, Cape Man Yazi told me, it's coming up, I think it's like two years ago now almost, that he ran into somebody that told him that they're, and this is a native guy, 
was in the Superstition Mountains and saw a giant. And he described it as not a Bigfoot, but like a giant caveman with, you know, hide clothing and a club. And it was about 15 feet tall. And he said he's never, ever going into the Superstition Mountains again. And no, he isn't going to go on anybody's show and talk about it. But he was willing to tell caveman that that's what he saw. And that's why he's never going there again. And he strongly encourages everybody else to not go there. <laughs> uh, there's also the report that I gave earlier this year where I was contacted by an insider who had a relative that was actually involved in what was going on, where one of the parks abruptly got shut down in Colorado. And the very next day, What Lurks Beneath channel on YouTube did a report on this story that I had heard more or less um, secondary from the horse's mouth uh, the day before. And he had most of the same details, not um, all the ones that I had, but he was talking about the same thing. So I went immediately and checked, well, you know, how many parks in Colorado are shut down right now? Well, there's three. Well, how many have been shut down for like a couple of days and no more? Well, there was one. I started paying attention to that one. And then about two days later, it abruptly opened up again. Well, the story that I had gotten is that there had been an incident, at least one park ranger and possibly some other people had been killed and that they had to shut the, the park down, chase everybody out of it, call in military kill team. And with the exact words, what I was told secondhand from the person that was boots on the ground had described it as another Kandahar incident. Oh, wow. So for people who may not know what the Kandahar incident is, what happened there? Well, this is over in, uh, I think it was 2003, early in the Afghanistan war period. And uh, there was a Marine recon or a group of Marines doing recon anyway. They were running around this one mountain area and they weren't, they didn't call back when they were supposed to and just vanished. So they sent in another unit to go try and find them. And they actually picked up their trail and started going up toward the mouth of this big cave up in the, the mountain. When they got up there, they saw a whole plethora of bones of various animals and what looked like military equipment, including a walkie talkie that was lying on the ground outside the cave. When they got close to the cave, they heard this tremendous roar and they were charged by what they describe as a half naked giant man, about 12, 15 feet tall. Uh, he was wielding a pike with one hand and had red hair, white skin, probably tan. And uh, he attacked him, uh, ran the first guy in the in their group through with the uh, pike that he was carrying, his big spear he had, and picked the guy up, still stuck on it in the air, and was getting ready to rush at him and attack him again. And at that point, the shock wore off, and one of them yelled fire at the face, which they all started doing which again, didn't bring him down immediately was when they brought the 50 cows to bear on his face that apparently they finally knocked his uh, giant butt down. But they found the remains of the missing Marines there. They called in for, you know, what do we do with a weird situation like this? And they were told to just stay there and wait. And then a big cargo helicopter came in, dropped cargo net. Uh, they loaded the body on the cargo net and the cargo helicopter took off with it. So this story is actually backed up by the report of a guy who was there on the ground claims this happened. And then another guy was at the air force base when the copter came in with the giant's corpse in the cargo net and was put down. And then they loaded it onto a, a huge cargo plane to fly it out from there. And he was one of the guys that guarded the corpse on the cargo plane. So we've actually got this story from two different sources. And Steve Quayle got one of my, I think L.A. Marzulli talked to the other guy, if I remember right. Right. So these giants, what do they look like? Are, are they are they humanoid or do they look like you and me, except maybe with yeah, worse it, hairdos? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, it's the, the same description and the same description as the giants of Lovelock Cave that Princess Winnemucca talked about fighting with the Paiute tribe for about two and a half years until the Paiutes won and killed them all. Um, again, same description, 12 to 15 feet tall, looked like giant white men, had long red hair and beards. Um, you know, some of them, uh, six digits, six toes, six fingers and double rows of teeth. And that also is, that's the classic description of the Nephilim, six digits, double rows of teeth. And that's one of the things that's, uh, come into the, a lot of people don't realize that, that one custom of 
the native tribes in North America, when they met somebody that they didn't know, they would hold their hand up. You know, they used to show that in all the old cowboy and Indian movies, hold their hand up and say, how? Well, they weren't really, whether they were saying how or not, they actually did that. They would hold their hand up. And the reason was so you could look at their hand and count that they only had five fingers, not six. Hmm. I never knew that. Yeah, the guys with the six fingers were the bad guys. <laughs> they were the ones that ate other people and uh, lorded over their little minion slave humans that they had. The mound builder culture that they've been digging up in Mississippi, that's another good example of them uh, hiding all this evidence and stuff because they've been digging up giant skeletons out of these mounds for decades, you know, like over for a couple hundred years now. And in a lot of... Uh, of cases early on, especially they carefully documented them. How big were they? What position were they setting in? You know, and if you've ever seen like old archaeological sketches and stuff, they're extremely exacting and detailed. And a lot of them were the same thing over and over again. It kind of reminds you of the old Viking burials in uh, Northern Europe where the extremely rich Lord would die and they would kill all of his slaves and retainers and bury them with them. And this was apparently similar to the same thing that was going on here. But in this case, the Lord was some giant that was, you know, seven to 12 feet tall. And all the retainers that were buried with him were just normal sized humans. Hmm. So around North America, where it is a colder climate, are these things putting fur on their back after, say, bear kills or wolf kills or or something along those lines to stay warm. Yeah, exactly. There's been um, a couple, uh, two, three giant sightings up in Alaska too. As a matter of fact, uh, Wes on Sasquatch Chronicles had somebody call him and tell him about it. And they wouldn't come on the show and talk about it because they're like, who the hell's going to believe this? Hard enough for people to even believe there's eight or 10 foot tall monkey looking Bigfoot things walking around. Nobody's going to believe there's giants walking around. And what they're reporting is all the same thing. They look like cavemen. They look like huge, you know, pasty white, white men with long red hair and beards and dressing in, you know, furs and leather and that kind of thing, whatever they can make it out of. Okay. So are they living in caves? Or are they living underground? Well, I would imagine, especially because most the ones that you get reported anymore are ones that are in really isolated areas, giant parks or huge forests out in the middle of nowhere. And, uh, you know, in places like that, first of all, they have to have lots and lots of food, so they need a big range. And if there's humans around to see them, then that's not going to work out very well. So they got to try and be out in the middle of nowhere. And I would expect they do the same exact thing that the uh, mountain giants and the Bigfoot and a lot of these other cryptids do in the colder climates. They all have underground lairs. And that's extremely common throughout mythology all over the world, too. All these big ogres and trolls and giants and stuff, they all have underground lairs. So it's like their own mini city down there. Yeah, I mean, it depends on what they've got available. I mean, you know, these things are gigantic and super strong. If they want to excavate and make their own tunnel systems, they sure as hell can do it. And a lot of them probably just take advantage of pre-existing karst systems. Um, you know, states like Nebraska, uh, where you don't really think about it, there's gigantic cave systems underneath it. You've got limestone and sandstone, and uh, the, the water goes through it and just hollows out these massive undergrounds. Well, they can take advantage of that. And then you've got lots of evidence of uh, not only uh, places like uh, the underground cities over in Turkey, which they're now starting to find were way more extensive than they think or thought, and that some of them are actually connected by tunnel systems. So there wasn't just like one huge underground city in Turkey. There was five or six, and they were all interconnected. Well, these things were all made for people. Apparently, they're for the right size as people. But, you know, why are you hiding underground? What is it on the surface that's making you hide underground? And then the other thing is that there have also been gigantic tunnels uncovered where the, the ceiling of the tunnel is 25, 30 feet up. And when you're talking about Stone Age primitive people with the supposedly primitive technology that we had at the time to excavate, why would you make anything that tall? You absolutely don't need to. There's no reason for it. And this was just in some kind of a service tunnel. It wasn't a show of extravagance like making the 
entrance to a gigantic temple and making the temple look gigantic and everything and showing opulence and power. This is just like a big tunnel that they had dug underground for some reason. They weren't mining any minerals out of it. And this is down in South America. And it was like 25, 30 feet tall. Why? Speaking of growing, we bring in the man, the myth, the legend. Super Duke from World Bigfoot Radio is here for the Cryptid Report. All right, Super Duke from World Bigfoot Radio has returned with an abbreviated cryptid report tonight. Duke, it's always a pleasure to have you here, my man. I always wanted to be here. And if anybody just strolls up to you on the street someday, Dave, and says, Dave, what do you think the ubicity of Sasquatch is? You may, with great certainty, tell them its ubicity is ubiquitous. Anyway, with that out of the way, I was uh, digging sure. around on some of my video from uh, September last night and uh, doing some previous work for an upcoming show and haven't got the guest on to record uh, what you know what all happened yet but i got the video from it and uh there was a piece of video where i went and walked up the as uh michael my research assistant dubbed it the magical hidden stream and unfortunately as i started to walk up the magical hidden stream i zoomed in to look at it and then i didn't pay attention to the fact that i didn't zoom back out again so most of that seven minutes of video is unusable garbage until I get back down to the road. And I've still got it zoomed in, not very far, but I don't realize I've still got it zoomed in. And I go back down to the road and I go across the road and I start walking up the road to where the truck with Keith Crabtree is sitting and you know he can't walk around the woods, so he's waiting for me. So as long as I'm walking up there, I start filming the ditch next to me on my left-hand side, which is very steep. And goes down quite a ways because that's right where there's a culvert that comes through and um, spews all this little uh, stream down downhill into the river so it makes quite a racket too so as i'm walking along i'm just filming it you know like yeah whatever if there's anything there i'll get it i'll stop film the stream zoom in a little bit okay that's all cool so i'm looking at that part last night and unfortunately i wish i would have known there's something there and moved a little slower but apparently there were several cryptids there and the one that uh, jumped right out at me was um, something that looks very canine with its head sticking out from underneath the pine tree looking at me you can see its snout and you can see the left side of its face and its nice red eye and you can see its fangs and its open mouth and its tongue does not look friendly and so that made me go well i need to go through this frame by frame and see what else i can spot and I've got Robin taking a look at it and several other people. Stephen Hill already got back and found two more uh, Bigfoot in the background besides the one that I spotted. So there are several of them there. And this is really creepy because while I'm up there on the hill walking around by myself in the woods, they should be following me around, right? No, they're sitting down by the truck where Keith is. <laughs> oh, no. Until I get back again. What the hell? <laughs> No, they're scared of you, Super Duke. They're scared Goober, of you. Goobers, you're supposed to be following me around so I can accidentally get you on video. You not trying to hide down by the truck. Damn it. Get out under my lawn so I can film you. So anyway, um, other than that, other interesting thing that happened, uh, just like yesterday, uh, the latest uh, video release from Small Town Monsters, Seth Breedlove. They're always fun. He, he makes good documentaries. Go check it out. This one I found particularly interesting. It's... Uh, um, the coastal Alaskan Sasquatch, they're out on the Kenai Peninsula at uh, somebody that I know's cabin, Scott, and they did the whole documentary on all the activity he was having there. And um, this is interesting to me because I had Rob Roy Menzies and the, um, the probably the best Alaskan Sasquatch tracker in existence, uh, Scott, Lord Scott, on my show. And they both went out to this cabin and did a weekend there and came back with a track cast and a whole bunch of stuff that had happened and um 
actually put that out on my show almost two years ago. So this is a follow-up uh, done with a big budget and really good cameras. And uh, yeah, everything that we already told you guys is true. So there you go. But to get on with what we're talking about tonight, we got part two of the Giants. I gave you the whole background on the Giants and stuff last time. Well, this time we're going to hear some reports. And again, we're going to the ancient Giants who ruled America and the Missing Skeletons and Great Smithsonian cover-up by Richard J. Dewhurst, which is encyclopedic in its scope. And if you ever wondered where's all this stuff about all these old giants being found and stuff, this is the book you need to own. There may be other ones out there, but if you're interested in giants in North America, get this book. Here's an example. Ohio account of nine-foot giants from the Stevens Point Journal, May 1st, 1886. It is very evident that in an early day in the history of this country, this section of Ohio was an important camping ground for the American Indian. And indeed, discoveries are frequently made which lead people interested in the matter of prehistoric America to believe that a race of mankind superior in size, strength, and intelligence to the common North Americans of the forest flourished not only along the coast east and south, but right here in southern Ohio. There are in this country several burying grounds, and two of them are located five miles west of the city near Jasper, one on the farm of Mr. William Bush and one on Mr. Marth Matthew Mark's farm. In a conversation with a gentleman who has seen these skeletons unearthed at the Mark's bank, we are told that many dozens of human skeletons have been exhumed since the bank was first opened. Some of these skeletons have been measured, and the largest has been found to be over nine feet long and more. At one time, 10 skeletons were exhumed. They'd been buried in a circle, standing in an erect position and were in a comparatively well-preserved condition. One remarkable fact about all the skeletons unearthed at these places is the perfect state of preservation in which their teeth are to be found. Not a decayed tooth has been discovered, and this would seem to indicate that these people naturally had excellent teeth or some method of extraordinary uh, manner in preserving them. So there you got one from Ohio. Now let's go hmm. to Winona, Minnesota. Indian, uh, the history of Winona County, 1883. Indian mounds and relics are found in various parts of the township. Not long since, while some men were digging in Mineral Bluff, some 150 feet above the river, a skeleton of unusual size was unearthed. On measuring, the skeleton was found to be 10 feet in length with other parts in proper proportion. In the skull was found a copper hatchet. Remember how we talked about the giants use copper weapons on each other? And a dart or arrowhead nine inches long, nine inches long. Another skeleton nine feet long was found in the village of Dresbach while some men were digging a road or trench. These skeletons were of an unusual size to those generally taken from Indian mounds. Their size, form, and structure would lead those well-versed in paleontology to believe they belong to a race prior to the Native Americans known here now. In many mounds have also been found copper hatchets, chisels, and various kinds of tomahawks and other weapons of war. Also, these antique races seem to have had some process for hardening copper unknown to any modern process. And this has come up since then with some of these things where they found these relics and went, well, this is like as if it was somehow uh, tempered, like a tempered steel object that we'd make today. But we don't know how to do that. Where they came from, when they lived, and from whence they have gone is only conjecture and speculation. That they were mighty races skilled in the mode of warfare, understanding the mechanical arts. For all these, we have conclusive evidence, but of their final end, we know nothing. And we then, never know anything. We never yeah. know anything. Well, what that's the fun know? part about science. You don't get to know anything for sure, absolutely. It's always more questions. True. So here we go. Colorado River, Nevada News, 1947. Near the Nevada, California, Arizona border area, 32 caves within a 180 square mile area were discovered to hold the remains of ancient, strangely costumed eight to nine foot giants. Eight to nine foot. They had been laid to rest wearing the skins of unknown animals similar to sheepskins fashioned into jackets with pants described by the discoverer as prehistoric zoot suits. Remember, this came out in 47. The same burial place had been found 10 to 15 years earlier by another man who made a deal with the Smithsonian. Ooh, 
The evidence of this find was stolen and covered up by Darwinian scientists. Dr. F. Bruce Russell had come to Death Valley from the East Coast for the sake of his health. He had taken up mining in the West and was exploring across the Colorado River into Arizona. What he found he described as the burial place of a tribal hierarchy within the ritual hall of an ancient people. He felt that some unknown catastrophe had driven them into these caves. All the implements of their civilization were there, including household utensils and stoves. Dr. Russell reported seeing hieroglyphics chiseled on carefully polished granite within what appeared to be a cavern temple. Another cave led to their sacred hall, which contained carvings of ritual devices and markings similar to those of the Masonic, Masonic order. A long tunnel from this temple led to a room where Russell said, quote, well-preserved remains of dinosaurs, saber-toothed tigers, imperial elephants, and other extinct beasts were paired off in niches as if on display, unquote. 10 to 15 years earlier, the caves had been seen by another miner who had fallen from the bottom of a mine shaft. In his book, Death Valley Men, Bork Lee related a conversation among residents of Death Valley concerning the local Paiute Native American legends of an underground city at Wingate Pass. After falling through the ceiling of an unknown tunnel, the miner had followed it 20 miles north of the Panamint Mountains to discover a huge underground ancient city. He saw arching stone vaults with huge stone doors and a polished round table at the center of their council chamber, which had once been lit by ingenious lights fueled by subterranean gases. Leaning against the walls were their tall gold spears. He said the designs of the thick golden armbands resembled the work of the Egyptians. The tunnel ended at an exit overlooking Furnace Creek Ranch in California's Imperial Valley. He could see from there that the valley had once been underwater. The tunnel entrance had been a dock or a quay located halfway up the side of the mountain now. A deal was made with the Smithsonian Museum for the find, but the miner was betrayed by his partner. The evidence was stolen and the entrance concealed. In a 1940 mining journal, another find was reported as much worked gold uh, found in an eight mile long cave near San Bernardino. University of Arizona professor Vine Deloria, himself a Native American, made a similar accusation against the Smithsonian for covering up the remains found within the burial mounds of the mound builder civilization. More on them later. Surviving diaries from before the time of Darwin attest to these discoveries. The mound builders were a different civilization than that of the Indians, they said. The mounds contained the remains of hundreds of giants, along with the bones of giant mastodons, etc. In Cincinnati, Ohio, the giant bones were found with large shields, swords, and engraved stone tablets. In Kentucky and Tennessee, the bones of, quote, powerful men of towering stature, unquote, were excavated. One of these seven-foot men was buried with an engraved copper plate beneath his head. A woman was also found, and she was wearing a silver girdle with letters written on it. The Detroit Free Press reported in 1884 the discovery in Gartersville, Mississippi, of the remains of a giant with waist-length jet black hair. He was wearing a copper crown. With him in his timber burial vault were his children who wore garments decorated with bone beads. The tomb was covered with large flagstones engraved with inscriptions. In Cayuga Township, Niagara, there's a place called the Cemetery of the Giants, which was discovered in 1880. Those giants were nine feet tall and appear to have died violent deaths. Their axes were found with them. Giant bones were also unearthed from a rock fisher on Lake Erie Island. In some of the finds of giant bones, the bones lay in confusion as if left on a battlefield. The Smithsonian does display some artifacts of the mound builders found with the bones of the giants, shell discs and carved stone beads. Many of the bones turned to pottery ash within a short time of being exposed to the air, which is a mute testament to their great antiquity. The Smithsonian has been reluctant to test some less fragile finds. The late Vine Deloria said that it is because they, quote, might find a really early date for the bones, unquote, and that it would be distressing to their timeline. And then we get to the mound builders. Sure. Ancient monuments of the Mississippi Valley. Professor E.L. Lively and J.L. Williamson of Friendly have made an examination of the giant skeletons found by children playing near the town. The femurs and vertebrae were found to be in a remarkable state of preservation and showed the persons to be of enormous stature. Skeletons ranged in height from the largest being seven foot six down to the smallest six foot seven. Skulls found are of peculiar formation. 
Forehead is low and slopes back gradually. Well, the back part of the head is very prominent, much more so than the skulls of people living today. In other words, cone heads like Paracas skulls. The legs are exceedingly long and the bones unusually large. The finding of the skeletons has created a great deal of interest in the general impression is that the bones of the remains of people who built the mounds, the largest in the country be located in a town uh, mysteriously called Moundsville in Marshall County. Now, if we go to Pennsylvania, we find a different kind of giant there. Charleston Daily Mail, September 20th, 1916. Sayre is a borough in Bradford County, Pennsylvania, 59 miles northwest of Scranton. The exact year is not clear, but during the 1880s, a large burial mound was discovered in Sayre. It was reported that a group of Americans uncovered several strange human skulls and bones. The skeletons belonged to anatomically normal men, with the exception of bony projections located about two inches above the eyebrows. It appeared the skulls had horns. The bones were characterized as giant as they were representative of people over seven feet tall. Scientists estimated the bodies had been buried around uh, 1200, um, 1200 AD. The archeology span discovery was made by a reputable group of antiquarians, including Dr. G.P. Donahue, the Pennsylvania State Dignitary of the Presbyterian Church, A.B. Skinner of the American Investigating Museum, and W.K. Moorhead, of the Phillips Academy and over Massachusetts. And this was not the first time a gigantic horned skulls were in North, North America. During the 19th century, similar skulls were discovered near Wellsville, New York, and in a mining village close to El Paso, Texas. At one time in history, human horns were used as a sign of kingship. Alexander the Great, in fact, is depicted with horns on some of his coins. In Moses' time, horns were a symbol of authority and power. Apparent pictures of these skulls do exist, and they have one in here but many people claim the discovery to be a hoax. Conversely, many websites suggest that the objects are of extraterrestrial origin. Oh, my. Mr. Duke, we have to call it the night right there on this abbreviated version of the cryptid report. But once again, absolutely amazing. I love the theme this week with everything to do with, you know, these these long skull and bones and where are they going? Is it the Smithsonian? Is it the government? Or is it in Super Duke's freezer? We will never really know. Well, maybe on the freezer we will. Super yeah, Duke so Sullivan from World Bigfoot Radio. my headquarters is full of the skeletons. Yeah, that's right. World Bigfoot Radio can be found all over the internet. YouTube, BitChute, Rumble, and so many more places. When we come back, it's the thought of the day. Get off my lawn, people. Let's do this thing. Lots of show left when we return. So make sure that you're kind to everyone. Uh, safety first, last, and always. Pay it forward. Don't be mean to people if you don't have to be. Uh, don't flip off the mountain giant. Don't poke dog man with a stick. Don't punt the puck, would you? And for God's sake, whatever you do, do not hug the Wookiee.